So Chip, if you're ready, can I ask you to start today's presentation? Thank you, Simon, and welcome everybody to this morning's presentation on system architectures, MOSA, and the FACE technical standard. Uh, we're going to discuss how this, uh, the FACE approach differs from other standards. I'm joined this morning with Chris Crook. He's the Senior Software Analyst for U.S. Army PEO Aviation, and also he serves as the Chair of the FACE Technical Working Group. Uh, I'm a Senior Market uh, Development Director of Aerospace and Defense at Real-Time Innovations, also known as RTI. I'm also the Chair of the Business Working Group Outreach Committee. So system architecture uh, is a description and representation of a system based on components and subsystems that will work together to achieve mission and operational functionality. A typical breakdown of system architecture for a DOD platform usually consists of the following subsystems. Uh, go ahead and click ahead, Chip. There you go. So so when we consider a, a DOD platform, uh, particularly an aviation platform, um, a system architecture is going to be defined in terms of certain subsystems. Now these can either be defined separately or as part of a collective design. Um, either way, a system is going to consist of uh, hardware, software, network, and in the case of airborne vehicles, a subsystem to define the entities and behavior for radio frequency and signal processing. Next slide. So this graphic is uh, sort of a continuation of the one uh, shown on the previous slide. And while there are many different architectural model modeling languages, tools, designs, and approaches, uh, this is meant to be notional in order to represent an abstract view of the different conceptual subsystems we previously touched on. Here we have shown some uh, examples. Go ahead and click ahead. Some examples of uh, most of the standards that can be used to define uh, the components and behavior for particular subsystems. For defining a network ar architecture, um, an example is the Victory Standard, which defines a network data bus for use on military vehicles. Uh, for hardware architectures over on the right, we have OpenVPX as an, ex as an open um, standard example, which defines an architecture framework that manages and constrains module and backplane designs. Uh, this includes uh, defining pinouts, and it also sets interoperability points. Um, down at the bottom at the RF uh, signal level, uh, MORA uh, extends the victory standard into the radio frequency arena by decomposing radio systems into high-level components that enable sharing of hardware such as uh, amplifiers and antennas. And then finally, at the software subsystem level, uh, and sort of the, the central viewpoint of this briefing, uh, the FACE technical standard can be used to realize abstracted software components that are portable between systems. Next. So modular open system approach, also known as MOSA, formerly known as an open systems architecture, OSA, or open systems approach, can be defined as a technical and business strategy for designing an affordable and adaptable system. There's five principles of MOSA. So MOSA um, is actually defined by 10 U.S. Code uh, 2446 Alpha, which took effect in January 2017. So the U.S. Code defines a set of rules for adherence to the modular open systems approach, which are consolidated into what is known throughout the community as the five principles of MOSA. Uh, the first of these is to establish an enabling environment. What that basically means is that the approach should include all of the necessary resources in order to specify, identify, develop, and sustain the approach. Uh, this should include things such as the uh, business approaches, contract guidance, technical guidance, training, et cetera. The second is to employ a mod modular design. Now, per the U.S. Code, uh, this is to allow severable major system components at the appropriate level to be increment incrementally added, removed, 
or replaced throughout the life cycle of a major system platform. The third is designate key interfaces. The most of the requirements uh, require that major system components be separated by a defined interface. And that brings us to item four, which is that MOSA implementa a MOSA implementation sorry, should use open standards, not just in the component design, but in the interface design as well. The last principle is to certify conformance, which is sort of an inherited requirement uh, in order to ensure that correct adherence to the MOSA design and interfaces um, is guaranteed. Next. So how does uh, the FACE approach uh, apply to this? So if we take a look at the first uh, item, as establish an enabling environment. Uh, the FACE business approach features a business guide, contract guide, software su uh, suppliers getting started guide, integrators guide, and many more documents I'll show you later in the presentation. Uh, there's also tools currently available to create FACE products. So as far as employing a modular design, the FACE technical standard defines a reference architecture and it is component based. These components are abstracted and grouped into logical segments based on the capabilities and services they provide, thus achieving the modular design. Whereas the notion of face, the face segments can sometimes be a little bit confusing, an implementation of the reference, face reference architecture is nothing more than a series of components that provide certain capabilities. Some of them have the sole purpose of enabling the capabilities of other components. Um, an example of this would be the components within the transport services segment, which those of you familiar with uh, FACE already will um, ha have familiarity with. And the trans transport services segment, and the, for particularly the components within it, provide other components the ability to move data. The FACE Technical Center also defines a data architecture in order to provide semantic descriptions of data that moves in and out of certain FACE software components, which are known as units of conformance. The third bullet is to designate key interfaces. So each uh, segment that Chris just, uh, just described is defined in the FACE reference architecture and provides these open defined interfaces that are, uh, can be easily accessed by anybody deploying the FACE standard. Uh, these interfaces, <coughs> are uh, just for common services and also provided uh, by the operating system segment. Uh, so in order to satisfy using open standards, the FACE technical standard uses open, commonly used consensus-based standards in its requirement for software components as well as its interfaces. Some examples of these are um, its use of POSIX, AIRINC 653, AIRINC 661, OpenGL, and there's quite a few more. And finally, you need to certify these components to uh, uh, adhere, make sure everybody adheres to the standard. So the FACE business approach defines a FACE conformance program that uses third-party entities called verification authorities to certify software components as being fully conforming to the FACE technical standard. Uh, there's no compliance uh, or partial conformance. Uh, it's all only 100% conforming is allowed per this FACE approach. Now there's been plenty of MOSA guidance out there and there's uh, a, a multitude of documents now declaring that MOSA is the way you should be building next generation systems uh, most likely the most uh, popular ones is Tri-Services mem Memo from January 2019. That cites FACE, SOSA, OMS, UCI, and Victory. And it's just uh, the use of MOSA is uh, considered uh, vital to the success of uh, the U.S. Uh, DOD. And it should be included in all requirements, programming, and development activities. Uh, the Army, Navy, Air Force have also issued separate guidance uh, around the MOSA requirement. So, um, just because you have a MOSA um, a, a, a MOSA approach, um, doesn't necessarily mean that that approach is open. So. Um, 
there have been certain vent, um, ventures to establish um, a MOSA design using an open standard. Now, the FACE approach follows this pattern by defining the FACE technical standard, which is an open standard published by the Open Group. Go ahead and go to the next uh, chip. Now, as a result, all the FACE technical standard, um, as well as all its supporting documents, are distribution A, and they are publicly available within the supporting, within the supporting ecosystem. That means that um, all guidance documents, all uh, business documents, contract guides, everything is open to the public. It is an open standard that implements MOSA. So, uh, you know, once again, the uh, um, MOSA is defined in, um, by the um, uh, 10 U.S. Code 2446 uh, Alpha, um, and, you know, this slide just kind of shows, um, you know, that FACE does satisfy um, the requirements in, um, the, in, in MOSA as, as defined by DOD. So the first was is that it employs a modular design, and yes, FACE does employ a modular design. It is it focuses at the uh, software component level. Um, it has defined interfaces, um, and you know as Nana Bonus uses all um, commonly used open standards. Um, it is subject, subjected to verification to ensure major system interfaces comply with, if available and, and suitable, widely supported and consensus-based standards. Once again, yes, FACE does satisfy that. Um, for its uh, OSS um, uh, level, its, its uh, interface to the operating system, it uses only um, open, commonly used um, APIs, POSIX, A-Ring 653. Um, to, to where um, FACE does not require anything proprietary in order to uh, implement units of conformance, aka software components, using the FACE technical standard. Uh, number three is that it uses a system architecture that allows several, several major system components at the appropriate level to be incrementally added, removed, or replaced throughout the life cycle of a major system. Uh, platform to afford oppor opportunities for enhanced competition and innovation. And once again, yes, FACE does allow for that. It is a component-based uh, system with defined um, interfaces to allow uh, greater uh, power to the integrator um, to manage the life cycle of the entire system. So the, the most approach uh, also integrates uh, technical requirements with contracting mechanisms and legal considerations to support a more rapid evolution of capabilities and technologies throughout the product life cycle. And this is through the use of uh, architecture, modularity, uh, open system standards, and, and uh, appropriate business practices. These uh, standards are well known. We use a lot of uh, different uh, types of both published standards from other uh, parties, and also we've created our own uh, business standards to assist in this approach. Uh, so, once again, uh, the DOD seeks to yield the following benefits with the MOSA approach. Uh, significant cost savings or avoidance, uh, absolutely, uh, there's a, essentially a product line mentality that surrounds uh, face architecture and face procurement because you can now have multiple companies target a, a class of components that can be distributed to the U.S. government or any other entity for a uh, next generation airborne platform. So, uh, <laughs> so yes, <laughs> face does uh, do this. Uh, and also, uh, uh, the DOD uh, hopes that you can uh, get a rapid uh, schedule reduction and allow for the rapid deployment of new technology as required. And once again, Casey tells us. Uh, the third one is really opportunities for technical upgrades and refresh outside of the older model where we had a very long three to five year, possibly even longer refresh cycle with base because it's very modular 
you can update these components uh, as required in a very rapid fashion without uh, upsetting the entire platform or uh, causing a retest of the entire platform. So once again, uh, FACE enables these uh, opportunities for technical upgrades. And then finally, the interoperability, including system to systems interoperability and mission integration. Once again, FACE does this quite well because it's all based upon standards that are uh, predefined as interoperable and it has been tested to be interoperable across platforms. So as far as how FACE fits uh, within the architecture picture, um, here we're bringing back a, a graphic from earlier in the presentation. In this blown out view, we have a notional environment boundary that would feature safety critical as well as non-safety critical software components as part of a software subsystem solution. Now in this example, we have a common bus separating the two environments where a face computing environment is used to house the safety critical software components. As part of a larger notional example, this is meant to convey that face is not intended to be the only solution within a software system architecture, but is a solution for implementing safety critical software components. Some unique features of the uh, FACE technical standard. Uh, for one, it is distro A. It is publicly available. Um, it has no competing abstraction layers. Um, all the software later, layers are prescriptive. Um, the flexibility allowed below the transport layer, um, it allows for a greater interoperability as far as uh, transport services, it abstracts the uh, the protocol and the uh, transport mechanism from the individual component, um, and it allows for uh, different sorts of capabilities to be implemented as far as the transport layer to do things such as message association, um, uh, transfer between certain uh, protocols, and things and things of that nature. It it but it the the underlying point is the abstraction of the transport from the individual software component um, allows for greater scalability and flexibility um, uh, for the integrator. Uh, governance at the data architecture level. Uh, this optimizes opportunities for reuse and interoperability by enforcing a common lexicon for component-to-component -component interfaces. It also, uh, um, here recently in Phase Technical Center 3.0, um, added an integration model to uh, facilitate systems integration and kind of make things a little bit more organized uh, in terms of the uh, system integrator. Uh, this provides a great way of uh, um, summarizing all the connections uh, involved in the face computing environment that is uh, maintained by the uh, system integrator. Uh, also, we have government industry collaboration on the standard itself and its supporting ecosystem. The uh, FACE technical standard and all its supporting documents are maintained by a um, uh, standards-based body. Oh, it looks like we've lost Chris off the audio chip. <laughs> okay, no problem. I'll take it from here, and if Chris uh, gets back on, we'll uh, uh, get him on board here. So uh, uh, it's really key that uh, there's over 100 government industry uh, collaborators on this standard. It's not a handful of, of uh, companies or defense contractors or even one uh, service or agency that created this. It's uh, 10 years of collaboration between government, industry, and academia. So it's, it's something that's uh, uh, well debated and uh, well understood by these companies. And uh, I think these published statements, uh, published documents from the uh, Space Centurion <coughs> prove that fact. Uh, it's really interesting that it's applicable for hard real-time, near real-time, and non-real-time systems. There's different profiles in the operating system uh, that can allow for this. It also allows for uh, uh, the safety and security capabilities. And then uh, finally, the FACE approach has a domain-specific data modeling mechanism 
it activates integration of public of multiple open standards on the same system. So you can actually bring in other standards as required. Okay, I'll, I'll do the next few slides here. Uh, so, you know, how, how does it uh, differ from other MOSA standards? Well, it's, it's suitable for, uh, uh, as I just mentioned, development of safety critical software applications. Uh, it utilizes uh, third party uh, conformance testing, it's called verification authorities, uh, for the verification of artifacts. So, you have an independent agency reviewing submissions for uh, conformance to the FACE technical standard. Uh, the te FACE technical standard defines requirements for conformance based on three levels of criticality, general purpose, safety, and security. And the FACE, the units of the conformance have been demonstrated to pass airworthiness certification. There's no blockage. In fact, in many cases, the FACE standard, the technical standard, uh, tends to enhance and create an ecosystem of people with uh, ready-to-go airworthiness certification evidence like RTCA DL178C. And then, uh, as Chris mentioned before, the FACE technical standards are all distribution A, so uh, they have a supporting ecosystem. Anybody in the world can download these uh, at no charge. Now, there's a lot of really interesting use cases for the application of the FACE technical standard. Uh, they can be as wide ranging as flight critical systems with strict airworthiness requirements and hard real time response. Uh, it can be mission systems that need to rapidly integrate the applications from a diverse supply chain. Uh, multi-domain operations uh, coming in from different uh, security domains or national domains and also multi-level security platforms uh, where we actually have today uh, two different companies in the face registry uh, with certified conformant capabilities there. Uh, so you can actually bring in different agencies, different services, coalition partners and bring in uh, data from these different uh, capabilities. Also systems are challenged with lowering the co total cost of operations. By design, FACE is very modular and uh, should and has uh, reduced the total cost of operations of many platforms. Uh, uh, the, uh, also, systems that need to separate and decouple critical software from new software innovations. It's uh, very, the partition capability of the FACE uh, technical standard allows you to bring in old software, new software, high criticality, low criti criticality uh, software, and, and run that on the same compute platform. Uh, it's also standards based at the uh, standard of standards, so we, you can bring in multiple industry and industry standards like ADA, ARIC 653, ARIC 664, C, Java, and others. So it's uh, quite open in that, and these standards are now built into the FACE technical standard, and we try to take advantage of those whenever possible. And then uh, the programs that are going to need software interoperability pre qualified through a formal conformance program with proven artifacts. We have that through the FACE uh, Certified Conformant Program. And then, once again, once a system that needs to support multiple levels of safety criticality or other types of criticality as defined by the integrator. So, there's use cases for the uh, application of this business approach. Uh, one, and probably the best one, platforms with very high cost of change or updates, upgrades. You can actually now uh, use the FACE approach to break apart some of the, I'll say, brittleness of those platforms to uh, insert new technologies as required. Uh, there's also programs that say, I like to uh, procure software from an app store with credentialed entries. It's not quite an app store. We have a FACE registry that actually talks about the uh, capabilities and, and the credentials behind those uh, capabilities, and then you would go to the software supplier to go procure that application. Uh, platforms that need to include software from many business domains and, and are diverse competitive supply chain. If, if you're trying to create a competitive environment when you go off a bid, FACE is a great way to do that. There's many companies now that have uh, FACE certified component product. I think we have now 20 in the FACE registry and there's a lot more coming. So it's a great way to, to say, here's a set of capabilities I need, uh, please uh, bid on this. Programs that need to reuse software over multiple or similar platforms, and I think this is especially true as we get into unmanned platforms where some of the capabilities are almost exactly the same. It's uh, perfect for those types of environments. Uh, systems challenge with lowering to total cost of operations, I mentioned four. And the real goal, um, 
But the real goal here is, you know, get the best avionics software to the warfighter faster. You know, basically an open standard uh, developed by government, industry, and academia uh, that enables a MOSA approach for these military avionic systems. It defines an architectural and business approach to developing procure, and procuring avionic software. Uh, the development of the face consortium technical standard and business approach is managed uh, independently by the open group. There's no government entity or no uh, set of companies or one company that can control the standard. And all the face uh, technical business got documents are published as much as before. So, um, oops, let's go back here. So, uh, how do you get started? Well, we have a face website, uh, and on this website, there's lots of different uh, options for you to go see. You can see the consortium activities and membership. I encourage uh, everyone to join the face consortium if you have an interest in the standard. There's links to public face documents and tools. Uh, there's a, a page on recent procurements and roadmaps for face acquisitions, and there's quite a few of these now. Uh, and, and also information for just navigating the uh, uh, face verification conformance process. And also to, uh, a link to the face registry that lists out the, the software platforms that have gone through face conformance. And also just help and support. And this, this is all on the opengroup.org slash face site. <clears throat> we uh, have been very busy over the last 10 years. We've, uh, Released quite a few uh, face documents for both the business and technical side. You can see the different uh, revisions of the face technical standard, shared data model, data governance, uh, conformance, uh, getting started guides, uh, verifications, uh, business guides. Uh, uh, 3.0 is coming out here soon. Uh, so there's lots of uh, publications. And if you want to uh, learn about face, just download all these publications and begin to read them. I'm sure you'll figure it out in about two years. Or you can just get started. If you're a software supplier, we have listed out, and this is up on the website, uh, documents that you should read uh, to get started uh, to understand what's going on from a software supplier, an integrator, an acquisition, data modeler, or business uh, perspective. The best thing you can do is get involved, join the FACE consortium. There is, uh, this is the place where when you go to these face-to-face -face meetings, if you really gain an understanding, you get to see the, the pre presentations and discussions of the uh, different uh, groups inside the FACE consortium, uh, talk about some of the common problems on the both technical and business side, and also just meet some really great people. And I think uh, people who have been involved with the FACE consortium for some time I have uh, developed lasting friendships uh, that will go well beyond uh, our work environment. And once again, you get the network of other FACE members at these meetings, and that's really key. So if you have uh, questions uh, or, or essentially ask me anything, uh, send the, those to ogphase-admin at opengroup.us, um, and they will vector that off to the right party to uh, uh, try to answer your question. Obviously, Chris Cook uh, is part of this uh, team today, uh, can be uh, is chair of the FACE Technical Working Group. Uh, I'm uh, chair of the Business Outreach Committee uh, on the business side. And once again, FACE consortium members, uh, everyone who attends FACE meetings uh, and we'll be happy to uh, describe uh, or answer any questions that, that they can. So, do we have any questions, Simon? We certainly do, uh, Chip. And so, first of all, thank you, Chip. Thank you, Chris, uh, for that presentation. Uh, before I go to the questions, we've had a number of inquiries about the slides, and my understanding is the slides will be posted to the Open Group Face website along with the recording. So you'll be able to download those slides on the Open Group Face website. So I'm going to work my way through the um, uh, questions on the QA, guys. So I'm going to start with Tim. And Tim asks, how do you achieve strong semantic typing in the face data architecture? And how does this relate to the open standards used for face? So um, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, and my apologies to everyone for my audio dropping. I just continued to talk away before I saw in the chat that uh, my audio had dropped. So um, sorry for that. And thank you, Chip, for uh, um, uh, uh, grabbing the ball and running and, and just running with it. So I appreciate that. So um, uh, the face data architecture in face. Um, so whenever you use um, 
the whenever you use the transport interface. The transport interface is typed to a specific message. And the face data architecture defines um, all of the um, semantic representations in a shared data model that data types in face can be realized from. So what that means is um, when you build your data model to describe your data, um, whether it be, you know, a position message um, that defines lat long and altitude, um, you have to use the um, uh, observables and measurements defined in the shared data model to realize those types. And the shared data model is managed by the phase consortium, uh, by, by a specific um, um, subcommittee. Um, you can um, use the PRCR process to add um, uh, things to it, but all data models that represent data traversing over a face interface must extend from a shared data model, which um, provides that strong semantic typing in order to uh, describe the data that you are representing at the IDL level, which will be represented um, um, at the programming language level once generated off the model. Um, as far as how this relates to um, open standards uh, use per face, um, it, it kind of does and it doesn't. This is just one of those things that um, is used for uh, conformance. Um, and to ensure, ensure that strong semantic typing in ensuring that uh, whenever an integrator uses a unit of conformance, aka a software component designed to face, um, there is no question as to uh, the representation of the data that is going to be traversing um, the interfaces that it is going to uh, be attached to. So that way if um, uh, an integrator needs to provide a message transformation or do anything with uh, that message that is traversing that interface, he has the knowledge in order to do that. Okay, Chris, that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, a question from John asking, what are your thoughts of combining all these standards? And he says that is Moza, Mora, Victory Face, Sosa into an all-encompassing standard. What do you think of that? Uh, that's an interesting request. I, I don't think that's going to be feasible because there is the, the level of technical knowledge required for each of those standards is very high. And I think it's far better to keep them as separate, and, but do as we did with the face consortium reference these other industry standards in the technical reference uh, guide. And so I think that's uh, key is that you want to leverage these other standards when possible, but I think trying to integrate and then coordinate the development of and the revision of all these standards under one large umbrella would be untenable. Over to you, Chris, if you have another idea. Um, well, for one, it would be a very large standard, and two, you know, just you know, just Chip said, like, uh, you know, you would have to have expertise on every single one of these in order to, you know, create such a, um, you know, a large standard. Now, there have been uh, ventures uh, within the DoD to create what is considered a uh, a standard of standards. Um, and what I mean by that is that uh, it, it, it applies to the overall system architecture design in that it has requirements like, you know, if you, uh, for, for all hardware, you have to use, um, you know, for, you know, for pin counts, you have to use um, the victory, oh, I'm sorry, the open VX standard and like that, but it is not like an overall standard. It just provides uh, guidance and requirements for implementing a system architecture based on existing uh, standards. So um, things like that have been done, but as far as uh, merging all of the standards into one to govern, um, you know, every single um, aspect of a system architecture, um, that is very hard to achieve, I would imagine, and there haven't been any um, discussions about doing that. Um, um, uh, uh, unless uh, 
someone had a, um, a good idea on how that would be accomplished. I'm not sure that that is a good idea at this time. But like I said, there have been, you know, um, standard of standards um, uh, ventures within the DOD to um, use all of the available standards um, within an architecture design. And I think the double down on that, uh, from a business perspective, it'd be very hard to fund that unless the DOD has a massive war chest to actually fund all these different organizations. Many of these standards are funded by commercial, not military or DOD uh, platforms like ERIC, like OpenGL, like POSIX. So I, I think it'd be very difficult to fund and coordinate uh, all these different standards under one umbrella. Okay, thank you, chaps. Um, we've got a question here from Todd, which you may want to take offline, but I'll ask it anyway. So Todd, Todd asks, what is the cost of third-party face conformance verification? So the verification authorities, uh, that the independent agreement between a software supplier and a verification authority. So it is a competitive environment. There's multiple verification authorities, and those will be individually negotiated uh, in most cases, if, it, if the uh, data and the uh, conformance verification matrix uh, in the test suite all uh, are in good shape, it should be somewhat very affordable. If you need help, and of course, many uh, folks need help, uh, especially on their first uh, phase conformance activity, uh, the VA is there to help, and therefore they, they will charge you more money uh, because they're they're helping you out to get to get through the process. But as uh, you get that into a more refined uh, activity, you can actually uh, reduce those costs uh, considerably. Okay, thank you. Um, Boris asks, can you explain the difference between FACE and IMA? I don't know if that's pronounced EMA or just IMA. So, um, I'll, I'll get that, Chris, even though it's a technical problem. Uh, a question. So, IMA is Integrated Modular Avionics. And there's a standard behind that called ERINC 653, managed by ERINC, uh, which is a commercial organization that manages uh, avionics standards and, and aircraft standards. So IMA is, is a time and space partitioning. Uh, it uh, breaks uh, platforms into uh, executable partitions, uh, executing on a strict time basis. So, but it, it, and IMA and ERINC 653 is part of a phase standard. It's actually a fundamental part of our operating system segment in the face technical standard, where it, uh, we look forward to uh, partitioning from both safety and a security standpoint, and also legacy and new uh, trusted and untrusted. So partitioning in the face uh, technical standard is a very important activity, and IMA and ERIC 653 is a fundamental uh, contributor to that. Okay, thank you. A uh, question from Erin, it's another difference between, asking what is the difference between a key interface and an interface? Or he says, or what is, the, what is a key interface and what makes it a key interface? So I would define a key interface as an interface where variance is expected to occur and you want that to be abstracted as much as possible. Um, as far as just, you know, an interface, you know, any API can be considered an interface. However, there are, you know, a ring 653 APIs, um, uh, POSIX APIs, things that um, are um, uh, version specific uh, um, referenced by a standard. Um, however, things like, you know, transport, um, logging, um, uh, you know, interfaces where you, the, the software developer has a, um, a greater array of choices on what can be implemented and where all those um, choices may be different from another developer. Um, I think that's what separates a key interface from, you know, say, you know, using, you know, something provided by, you know, POSIX as far as, you know, getting your host name. So um, places where you see um, um, barriers to integration, those are where you're going to see uh, key interfaces. And what uh, FACE defines as key interfaces are, uh, one, the transport, 
the operating system, but it, solved, but it solved the operating system by deferring to um, uh, commonly used open standards. Um, uh, I.O. operations as far as device drivers, um, configuration, and I believe that's about it. Uh, as for right now, there are other um, uh, interfaces uh, forthcoming. Um, uh, I, I know there's a, a pipeline in the works for a logging API, but that's still in the works. But yeah, um, you know, basically, you know, to, to, to encompass the, the overall point, uh, a key interface is where uh, variance is going to occur from software supplier to software supplier. Okay, thank you. Um, question from Tony. Is this modular approach extended to the platform support and operation activities, for example, mission planning and mission data creation? Who, who fences that one, Chris? Chip? <laughs> I think we're both pondering an answer to that. I, I think the answer is, 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 is no. Uh, you know, we don't control that aspect of it <clears throat> for the uh, architecture of an airborne avionics platform but, uh, and system, not the entire avionics platform or airborne platform. So we really focus on the compute systems inside an aircraft. Yes, I agree. That goes beyond uh, the the scope uh, for MOSA, and that gets into uh, more platform specific operations that could be realized using the MOSA approach, but you know, not necessarily governed by MOSA itself. Okay, that's great. Thank you. A question from AV asking: Are Face and MOSA new standards, and are they listed or included under the overall DoD? architectural framework, documentation versions one, two, three, et cetera, or are they linked separately to the DOD AF? So the idea of MOSA is relatively new, and MOSA itself is not a standard. It's more or less a template for creating a standard. Uh, FACE has been around since, uh, what, Chip, 2010, and when did uh, 1.0 come out? I think about two years later. Okay. So yeah, and since then we've had you know 2.0, 2.1, and uh, in 2017, 3.0. So um, not so much new, but as far as uh, products that are aligned to face, uh, those are still up and coming, and um, you know deployment of face components is still um, um, forthcoming. So new in one sense, not so much new in another. Um, as far as uh, DODAF, um, Chip, do you have an answer for that one? I'm sorry, I don't. Okay, guys, that's great. Uh, Todd asks, have the claims related to FACE presented on slide 13 been substantiated with real world program results? That's interesting. All right, let's go back to slide 13 real quick. So as far as number one, we don't yet have metrics on On, on, we don't really yet have metrics on that. That is kind of a a long term solution, um, and that's really only realized when you have a family of uh, software components in a system that um, you know kind of give you a kind of a base to 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 measure the the true cost savings um, that, that can be realized using FACE. So we don't yet have the metrics for number one. Um, same thing for number two, um, don't yet have a metric for that. Um, three, um, don't really either. However, the, the, 
the overall design of components uh, using the phase technical standard does allow for this by, you know, separating uh, capabilities and abstracting uh, certain behavior from the software component level in order to allow for um, uh, new technologies to be integrated um, and, and also forthcoming additions for the face technical standard also, um, you know, add to, um, you know, new, new, techno new technology in terms of uh, new versions of programming languages and things like that. I know in, in 3.0 we added um, support for new versions of C++ as well as ADA. So, um, and as far as uh, interoperability, um, yes, we have shown interoperability as far as uh, uh, interfacing with, excuse me, uh, uh, legacy components and, and as far as um, interoperability with software components that um, leverage other standards. So um, three and four, yes, one and two, we don't really yet have metrics on. And I'll step in there, Chris. I think we can be a little bit more aggressive. I appreciate your conservative view on this, but as far as number one goes, we are bidding separate entities on a platform now, where before that is not possible. I had to go through a, a large systems integrator. So we are immediately saving uh, costs uh, and uh, avoiding additional costs by being able to separate, bid on you know, parts of a platform, not the entire platform, the modification of the entire aircraft platform. Uh, certainly schedule reduction, we've, we've proven that. I don't think we track these metrics well when we do military programs, but we certainly have proven that integrating a very complex solution stack with uh, avionics, uh, uh, cockpit software, uh, uh, transport services systems, uh, operating systems, uh, graphic subsystems, uh, you can now do that quite quickly because we actually have these uh, interfaces with the face uh, technical uh, guide. So I think that's uh, uh, two things that we, we absolutely can say I think that top opportunities also for technical upgrade and refresh are now, uh, there's not more aircraft, but there's more opportunities for more vendors that you uh, can actually bid on a program where before you might have been locked out. And obviously interoperability uh, using this uh, uh, base approach uh, is absolutely uh, uh, proven where you can actually bring in different types of systems and integrate them uh, quite quickly. And I'm talking weeks versus months or years. Over. Um, uh, also, one of our uh, colleagues kind of put in the chat that, you know, through um, uh, BALSA evidence um, and showing different uh, uh, demonstrations and integration efforts, uh, there have been shown uh, anywhere, anywhere from 25 to 75 percent um, uh, reduction in integration um, efforts that we've uh, um, learned through those ventures. So uh, thank you, Corwin, for uh, um, uh, putting that in the chat. That's great, and I think everyone appreciates your further clarification on that. Fantastic, thank you. Um, John asks, when you say safety critical, is it just software, or is it down to the process, process level as well? In terms of face, just software. Excellent, that's a quick, a quick answer to a short question. <laughs> Let me just expand upon that. Uh, absolutely, with regard to face, it's just software. But if you're going to get airworthiness or uh, get the safety certification with the uh, DO-178C for software and DO-254 for hardware, typically you're going to combine both those standards to achieve uh, the safety certification. That's great. Well, that was a short question. This is a slightly longer question from Vincent. They ask, does FACE support data mediation? Is this our message details change over time? And he says, for example, new fields added, et cetera. And we are looking for a capability that will help our publishers and subscribers mediate between different versions of the same message set. Who would like to pick that one up? I'll take that one. So that capability can be um, uh, supplied via a, um, 
a, a component in the transport services segment. Uh, the way the transport services segment in FACE is set up are, allows for a range of capabilities that are pretty much up to the software supplier as far as, you know, how detailed they want to get. But, you know, say you have um, a software component that, you know, sends data according to an old version of a message, and you have a new component um, that expects it in a newer version, which has new fields or a change fields. You can implement in the transport um, supplied by face, or not supplied by face, um, you can add, you, you can have a capability in a transport aligned to the face technical standard that allows for message transformations from one version of a message to another. So um, that is certainly possible. Um, uh, FACE is uh, set up to allow for that kind of uh, behavior, although it is not uh, defined directly. Um, uh, there is nothing prohibiting a, um, PA, a transport vendor uh, from implementing that behavior. Okay, thank you. Question from Tim asks, what role have regulators played in developing the FACE approach? How does FACE change safety audit requirements? So this is Chip Downing. So safety uh, uh, is part of FACE only in respect of that we, we want to either uh, enable airworthiness faster uh, or uh, make, uh, make platforms and systems that don't uh, add to a safety burden. Uh, but we do not have a safety standard within FACE. So the, uh, it, that would all be controlled by regulators uh, in deploying, you know, DL 178 c or uh, some other type of safety certification standard. That's not something that the FACE consortium uh, controls itself. We do have um, um, DL 178 um, uh, well, personnel with DL 178 knowledge and expertise that assist in uh, publishing airworthiness guidance as far as implementing the face requirements. So whereas if, you know, an implementation of the face requirements doesn't um, guarantee a safety certification or safety audit, um, there is guidance available in the face technical standard and in supporting documents uh, to ensure that um, uh, safety considerations uh, um, are taken into account when you are designing your face component. Okay, thank you. Uh, another reasonably lengthy question here. I'll try and uh, read it out as clearly as possible. This is from Peter. So Peter asks, may we assume there are FACE and MOSA definitions on the data labels, etc., which come in from 429 for air data and or inertial? If so, what are those parameters or where is the document that defines it? Good luck, guys. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds like yours, Chris. Thanks, Chip. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to like uh, make sure I understand the question. Um, let's see. Do you want me to read it again, Chris? No, I I I, I, I can see it on the on the Q and A. I'm just um, I'm I'm parsing the language here. Um, Hmm. Chris, if I'm understanding the if if I'm understanding the question correctly, uh, which I may not be, um, and and if I don't um, uh, if I don't answer this uh, in in the way that you um, uh, put forth the, the the question, please please feel free to contact me when we can actually uh, have a discussion about this. You know, to, to make sure that. You know, I'm, I'm addressing your question appropriately. I don't want to leave you with, you know, um, a lack of information. And, you know, once again, my contact info is in these slides. Um, as far as the interpretation and data labels for, you know, parsing 429 messages, this is all going to be um, uh, uh, modeled in your uh, ULP supplied model. 
as far as um, uh, providing definitions and the semantic meanings behind the elements of your data message. So all that is going to be covered by data architecture, uh, which is defined in the FACE technical standard. And um, uh, once again, if I uh, didn't answer your question adequately or you meant something else, uh, please contact me and we'll um, uh, discuss this and I can pull the people in the room that have more knowledge uh, than I do on this specific uh, subject area. That's great, Chris. And Peter, thank you. You've got the guys thinking there, so that's excellent. Um, so a question here from Drav, and I hope I pronounced your uh, name correctly. Uh, Drav asks, what's the latest status of face-related tools? So there are um, tool vendors out there that um, uh, provide products that have the ability to uh, develop and parse and generate um, uh, code using FACE data models. So those are out there. Um, uh, the FACE Consortium website has a third-party tools listing that has a few of those out there. Um, the FACE Consortium also um, uh, has um, plugins available for certain tools, and usually those are on the third-party tools page as well. Um, Another good tool to use is the conformance test suite. Uh, the conformance test suite uh, can be used to generate code and generate dependencies for testing your uh, software that is aligned to the FACE technical standard. Uh, but I, I would advise you to try the third-party tools website and see what all is listed there. Um, um, I think there's quite a few vendors out there that uh, don't list their um, products on that page, but um, um, uh, if you reach out to um, um, some of the open group representatives, I'm sure they can point you in the right direction. Thank you. Uh, another specific question, this is from Mike. Um, it says, United States Air Force's OMS choose to define interfaces to various devices, you say, for example, radar, EO, et cetera. But it, say, it seems face as not. How will you get interoperability if different vendors choose different interfaces? So all this is um, abstracted via an interface in face. Um, because of the wide range of different um, external inputs, uh, device drivers, and things of that uh, nature, um, there is a certain point that FACE doesn't dive into as far as, um, you know, certain uh, hardware. We abstract that in the um, I.O. services segment where you can define um, a particular um, um, software components to interface with certain buses, device drivers, or certain pieces of hardware to where the interface that is used uh, by the unique software component to consume or to uh, um, right to those pieces of hardware, device drivers, et cetera, um, the interface is relatively constant and is abstracted in such a way to where if the devices change or um, um, new capabilities come about to where that software component that interfaces with that particular bus or device uh, needs to change, the software component that consumes the data doesn't need to change. So that is how we achieve interoperability as far as devices and hardware. Um, uh, OMS just chose um, a different route. It's, you know, neither solution is wrong. It's just a different way of doing it. Um, there are certain things that OMS does that FACE um, um, doesn't and vice versa. So it's just a different approach. Uh, FACE chose to uh, standardize an interface that um, abstracts external interfaces away from the environment. Um, so that's how we achieve interoperability in FAKES. Well, that's great. Guys, we've come to, we're virtually at the end of our hour, um, so I'd like to call it a day here. We haven't been able to get, we've got loads of questions. So first of all, to the attendees, we share, or sorry, we um, um, save all your questions and they will be, uh, they will be shared with uh, today's speakers. Also, if you have a question that you'd like to ask the team, then the email address is ogface-admin at opengroup.org. So that's ogface-admin at opengroup.org. So Chip, Chris, before I end, just, are there any final comments you'd like to make to our, our attendees today? I appreciate uh, I uh, like that. Go ahead, Chris. 
Oh, I'm sorry, Chip. Uh, we both kind of jumped in there. Um, yeah, I would just like to thank everyone for dialing in. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you to you know for listening to what we uh, you know have to um, say about MOSA and the face technical standard. Uh, I, I, for one, hope uh, this has been beneficial uh, to everyone and that we um, were able to kind of give you a little bit better perspective on how FACE implements MOSA and MOSA, you know, in general. Um, so uh, I hope this was beneficial. Um, I hope we answered your questions adequately. If not, please get in touch with us because uh, we would like the opportunity to, to answer your questions and make sure that we provide the best knowledge that we can. Uh, but overall, thank you for joining us. Um, sorry, back to you, Chip. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. I think you said uh, everything quite well. I just echo Chris's uh, comments. Thank you uh, once again for uh, uh, attending this webinar. I think it was very informative for everyone involved. So thanks again. Take care.